Hey, everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Widener Show. We're here with a terrific lady who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and uh, international relationship expert and media spokesperson on narcissism and codependency. And she's um, author of a few books. We'll be talking about her latest in just a minute. She's counseled individual and couples for over 30 years and coaches uh, internationally. Her new book that basically helps you understand and improve your uh, relationship and also includes a step-by-step -step program of scripts to confront abuse and uh, make sure your needs are met and also discover signs of a narcissist and also identify, understand, and regain control as well. Her book is called Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist. We'll talk about that. Darlene Lancer. Darlene, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for asking me to be on your show. How'd you first uh, precisely got interested in the subject of narcissism? First of all, I have a narcissist in my family. Oh. So that was uh, always an interest of mine. Uh, and then it, it started when people started coming to me and they were in relationships with narcissists because I hadn't written about it before. There was so much interest from my followers in social media that I, I did more research and I wrote this book on it, uh, dealing with a narcissist. A lot of the things that apply to being in a relationship with an addict, which I was familiar with, and this is common with codependency, really apply to any abusive relationship with a narcissist too. Most of the people in relationships with a narcissist are codependent. It dovetails and I and now I have expertise in both. And so I, I look at it from both sides. And what are the signs of a narcissist? A lot of people throw that word around and they say, oh, that person's so narcissistic or they're so selfish or they're taking pictures of themselves or they want to be the center of attention. There's more involved to having NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, hmm. than those traits. So you can have narcissistic traits. You can have a lot of them, but be what's called subclinical. So you don't not officially have the disorder. But to be diagnosed with NPD, you have to have a lack of empathy. So you don't have empathy for other people's feelings. Narcissists project a lot. So they don't really see you as separate from themselves. They don't realize that you are a person with individual feelings and needs that are unlike themselves. They're very in it for themselves. They're selfish. They're, they think about relationships in terms of transactions. They want to get the most and invest the least, the best deal I can get. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're usually, and they also think that they're better than other people that's the arrogance but underneath is a lot of shame you wouldn't see that they think their self-esteem is very high because they think highly of themselves but they need constant reinforcement that they're okay and that they're liked and they're admired and that they're great they have a sense of grandiosity and they like to be in the best restaurant wearing the best clothes they'll brag that they went to the best school and they drive the most desirable car so they want to associate with high status people, high status institutions, and it's all to compensate for not feeling enough inside. I also wrote a book about shame. So shame underlies both codependency and narcissism. And that's what they share in common is this sense of shame underneath. But the behavior is different. A codependent, they may not be conscious of the shame, but they'll feel like they're just not good enough and they'll feel like they have to compensate. They blame themselves a lot. They're victims of abuse because they take it in as like true about themselves, can't stand up for themselves. And a narcissist is kind of the mirror opposite. So they think they're better than everybody else. They may also, you asked about the traits, have a sense of entitlement. So they feel like they're special. They shouldn't have to wait in line. They should get special treatment. They brag about how great they are. They won't take responsibility for anything. Now, the codependent takes responsi too much responsibility, like it's all my fault. The narcissist will blame them. So it kind of fits. The narcissist blames, <clears throat> the codependent accepts the blame. But underneath, there's both shame. So it's like a seesaw. You know, one's a high and one's low, but you could flip it. That's what my book is really about. It's like how to empower people around the narcissist how to raise your self-esteem and level the playing field. And if you get really confident, you'll start to see that the narcissist starts to get very insecure and very needy. And the whole relationship changes. 
And is it possible to uh, change a narcissist as well too? And if so, how, how long would it take? Does it depend upon a person? Can it, how, how quickly can it be cured? Does it just takes time well, or? Well, let me point out that first of all, it exists on a continuum. There's mild narcissism, and then you have extreme cases where they call it malignant narcissism, where they uh, act maliciously. They may break laws, very immoral activity or illegal activity. The more they tend to look like sociopathic qualities, mm. uh, the more malignant. And also the more aggressive a person is, the more severe the narcissism. Like sometimes they'll be physically violent, but not all narcissists are violent. So it's, it's not across the board. Mm. Um, in terms of change, uh, usually it takes years of therapy most narcissists don't want to go to therapy because, as I said, they don't want any responsibility because of their shame. They start, they go to therapy and they start looking at themselves and they run. They don't want to see anything, any weaknesses or any flaws in themselves. They want to be perfect. And that's all to defend that sense of perfectionism about themselves, defends them against deep shame. But you can start to change their behavior in the way you interact with them when they see that it's in their best interest to, not just because you, they hurt your feelings, but because it's going to improve the whole relationship and it'll be better for them. So you have to learn to communicate with them in an educative way. And I explain all this in my book. I even have scripts and strategies and a step-by-step -step plan. So you can't, confront them in the way that you would someone else because they're very thin skinned because of their shame. And so they'll react and then they'll just be more aggressive. So you have to handle them with kids gloves and know exactly how to talk to them. But they can just like you may know if you know any narcissists or observe them, they can act very charming and appropriate in certain situations. And then maybe they get home and they will be abusive at home and be charming in public. That's not unusual. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, everybody loves my husband or they love my wife. They don't understand like why I'm unhappy because it's all hidden. But the point being, when it serves them to be appropriate and be nice and look good, they can. If they want to impress somebody, they will. So you have to be able to show that it's in their best interest to be that way at home too. That's a really interesting subject. You also mentioned about, um, you know, so sociopath and everything else, psychopath and everything. That seems to be a trait, of course, a lot of the um, criminal masterminds, but I think you pretty much uh, saw the right there. And um, among the so sociopaths or psychopaths out there, what percentage would you say have like a, a narcissistic personality? What would you say? Okay, well, those are different diagnoses, okay? So first of all, Although there's a lot of talk about narcissists and also you see them in the public eye, okay? So you might think that there are a lot and there's more in the entertainment business probably and politics than there are in the general population because they mm -hmm. like the attention. But it's, it's probably under 5% of the whole population. And mm -hmm. of those, it's maybe 1% malignant type that are really malicious and dangerous. Sometimes there's an overlap and they have both sociopathic qualities like aggression, conduct disorder that started in childhood, breaking the law, things like that, violence. And they may have that and be a narcissist, but that's really distinct. And one of the, and I'm kind of talking about sociopathic and psychopathic, they're actually different. Uh, they say a sociopath is made, uh, meaning it's environmental, and a psychopath is born, meaning it's more genetic. And by the way, research is showing that about half of the cause of narcissism may be genetic too. So it does run into Wow. Family. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the difference is, what I was going to say is that um, sociopaths, they don't care so much how they look. Mm -hmm. So they have a goal, and they'll even act, demean themselves if it's going to serve but a narcissist won't do that. A narcissist is more impulsive. Somebody who's going to plot and plot, you know, and scheme how they're going to commit a crime. That's more a, a criminal mind more than a narcissist. A narcissist wants validation. They want attention. They're going to say how great they are and try and impress you. And they can be manipulated that way. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Somebody who is wants to look good, you know how to manipulate them. But a, a psychopath, you can't manipulate them as much because they're very single-minded as to what, what they want and what they're going to do. You covered as well, conquering shame and codependency, the eight steps to freeing the true you and um, codependency for dummies. I think that's all covered as well, too. Once again, uh, explain the eight steps to uh, freeing the true you when it comes to your uh, book, Conquering Shame and uh, Codependency. Well, first of all, one of the biggest obstacles to self-esteem is our inner critic. So I always tell people, and I wrote a book about overcoming self-criticism. Uh, is to write down your negative self-talk. And that includes the shoulds. You think you should have done or should do in the future. Like, are you shitting on yourself all the time? <laughs> what a coulda, <laughs> shoulda, yeah. <laughs> and you call yourself names, you know, that was so dumb, or I'm lazy, what's wrong with me? Why did I do that? That's all self-shaming. Mm. Okay? And... Uh, you know, the other things is like overcoming guilt. Are you carrying around guilt from your past? The first thing is actually getting to know yourself, finding your, it's about finding your true self, to write about your feelings, journal every day, uh, write down conversations you've had and see whether you were authentic or not. Mm-hmm. Did you go along with something that you disagreed with? Did you want to get off the phone and you didn't? Did you, you know, disagree or want to set a boundary and you didn't write about it and then ask yourself why because authenticity is the opposite of shame Mm -hmm. so becoming more authentic and you have to know yourself uh, obviously to be able to reveal yourself so a lot of people aren't aware what they're feeling and then or they can't name them they say i'm upset well that doesn't tell me whether they're angry or they're sad or they're feeling ashamed or guilty so getting to know know yourself and getting to know your shame. What do you feel ashamed about? Is it your looks, your intelligence, uh, your earning capacity? That's different between men and women. And where does it come from? I have a whole chapter on exploring your childhood. So it usually comes from your childhood. Could be bullying also in, or in school or from a sibling. Or okay, like I was about to give an example of- Yes, that's of right. Challenging mm-hmm. at least, okay. So for instance, um, maybe you had a parent that was uh, very weight conscious. Mm. And so they were always, maybe they were always on a diet. I've had clients who have parents that are constantly commenting on their appearance. Oh my. So to understand that that's your parents' issue, it's not yours. Mm. It could be, even I've had couples where let's say the husband, the husband, the male is, very obsessed about his appearance. And so he's nagging his wife all the time and her weight is normal, but she's not thin enough because it's his issue. So understand where these messages come from, the values come from. For instance, if you have a narcissistic parent, they'll typically say that you're self-centered, but it's a projection about them. They're the ones that are self-centered. Shame gets carried down from generations too. So there might be criminality or adultery or addiction or something, a mental illness in the family. And the family tries to cover that up. And so you carry around this shame that our fa- there's something wrong with me, or uh, you're of a lower class than your classmates, not enough money. But that's not a reflection of who you are. Or parents compare you, compare you to other siblings, compare you to the neighbors compare you to themselves. When I was your age, you know. Oh, I've heard that adage before. And you got to sit there and listen for like 20 minutes, one hour, and they lecture on that. We've all been there, done that. So Okay. So that's shaming. You know, when you start comparing, that's also how you criticize yourself. You compare yourself to your friends or, or your ideal of where you should be. That's another thing. People have a, these ideal images of themselves and they're constantly comparing themselves to how they think they should be. So that's shaming of yourself too. So getting to the root of the shame, and I have a lot of exercises and ways to do that. And then you kind of figure out where these beliefs and standards come from that you're carrying around. Maybe it's from your grandparents or something that, and you don't even agree with. And then you have to start to build your self-esteem and doing esteemable acts, being authentic, being honest, maybe learning, developing new skills. And again, how you talk to yourself is important. Forgiving yourself, 
for things in the past. And then it's important to share your shame because uh, there's a saying, you know, when you share your joy, it's doubled. When you share your grief, it's halved. Mm. Well, when you share your shame, you're being authentic. And then it, it reduces it. So the thing about shame is you think the worst part of it, unlike guilt, is that I'm uniquely defective. So it's a feeling of alienation from the human race. There's something wrong with me that other people can see or that I'm uniquely defective. So when you share it with someone, they say, oh, yeah, I've had thought that or I felt that or, yeah, I can understand that. It just can evaporate, you know, years of feeling shame. That's one of the one thing that's great about group process and 12-step groups where you can share vulnerable feelings and you can feel better about it. Also sharing with a the therapist that can say, well, there's no reason for you to feel shame about that. And here's why. And so sharing your secrets, you know, that is healing. So that's one thing. And then you have to learn to love yourself and accept yourself because none of us are perfect. So even with, with flaws that we have, being able to say, yeah, I do that. Sometimes I do this and sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm selfish and sometimes I'm uh, can be angry or hurt someone's feelings and it's not a disaster. You know, sometimes I feel lazy. Sometimes I'm uh, forgetful. Mm -hmm. And accept yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's rather interesting too, like with uh, some of the eight steps, we encourage everybody to check out the book, Conquering Shame and Codependency, Eight Steps to uh, Freeing the True You. And uh, let's talk about your book, uh, Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist. Um, you know, and of course, you know, how do you, how you di discover diagnosis, type and deep motivations, recognize the warnings and everything, and uh, maybe just some of the pointers, um, you know, what to look up for, what to recognize, and um, also has a step-by-step -step program, more about the book. So first you have to understand who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So you really have to understand the way a narcissist thinks because a narcissist will prioritize power because that's the most important defense and to not feel ashamed. They want to be on top and have power. They will sacrifice the relationship to get it. Their partners usually have the opposite agenda. They will prioritize the relationship and sacrifice themselves to keep it. So you have different motivations. And as I said, a narcissist can't empathize a lot of people think, well, they, he should know what I'm feeling. He should, you know, be able to understand that that hurts me or, but no, they don't, they don't. You, you can't expect them to read your mind or her. And the narcissists uh, are typically disagreeable in their personality. That's a personality trait. Some traits are inherited. They don't mind mixing things up. And if they can get what they want. And they may want to put you on the defensive in order to have power over you. So you have to do the opposite. Your inclination may be to not make waves and go along to get along. But a narcissist is interested in getting ahead. They don't care about getting along. So their partners hate conflict and narcissists love conflict because then they can have a chance to be on top. They always are looking to be one up on someone else. So you have to kind of understand them and where they're coming from. That's the first thing. One of the next things you have to do is detach. Because when you react to them, you give away your power. So typically doing what comes naturally is to go appease someone, try to you know, pacify them, keep the peace, or explain yourself or defend yourself. When you defend yourself, what are you doing? You're telling the other person they have a right to judge you. No, I didn't mean that. I meant this. No, this is your, your understanding, my intention. You go all through all this explanation. You're giving them the right to judge you. So you're putting your self-esteem in someone else's hand and making excuses for yourself. You don't, they're not really interested in your explanation. Actually, to a narcissist, often the facts get in the way. They don't mm. care about the facts. They just want to win the argument. That's really interesting. I think you pretty much hit a point. And of course, you know, many of us had um you know, encountered it and go by the route and everything. And of course, you know, what are some of the ways to, to improve a relationship? And of course, um, you know, 
how how would you how would you leave one? So it's like you know you have a choice. You can improve or you can also leave. First of all, most of the people that contact me, they want to keep the relationship. And a lot of times, if they're le- if they're ready to leave, they would have already left. They wouldn't be reading the book, and they wouldn't they wouldn't be um, calling a therapist. Okay. Mm-hmm. So one of the things is people don't realize outsiders don't realize an abusive relationship is harder to leave than a normal relationship because what happens is. Ooh, there's a, a, a term called trauma bonding. So when you're continually shamed and put down, you start to become, you look for any signs of kindness and you become more, maybe you get crumbs of kindness or affection and little gestures, and then you cling to that and it becomes addictive. It's called mm-hmm. intermittent refor- and reinforcement, like playing a slot machine. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. You don't win all the time. Once in a while you win, but so you keep playing or gambling, you keep playing for that, the, those, you know, jackpot till you get the jackpot. In the beginning, the narcissist is very seductive and charming and can be loving and romantic. And so you're looking for the, to, to find that person that was very congenial and warm and, and the person that you fell in love with. And you're hoping that he or she will come back. And once in a while, I'll give you some hope. You know, but over the year, over years, it gets less and less. They've done tests like this with with rats, actually. <laughs> They'll keep pressing the lever for food, even when no food comes anymore. There's no reward. So it becomes an addictive process, just like gambling. And it gets hard to leave. And then the other thing is, sometimes they still love the narcissist. So I say, you know, love is no excuse for abuse. Mm. So a lot of times the partner is very empathetic. That comes naturally to them. And they think, well, he didn't mean it, or she had a bad childhood, and they're very understanding, and they keep hope the person hoping the person will change. And they go into the they go into denial. They don't realize exactly that they're being abused because maybe then there's a good time or they get along for a weekend or something, and then they get their hopes up until the next time. So that's part of the process, coming out of denial and realizing, gee, am I really with someone who has a mental illness? That's kind of a shock. And maybe it's not going to turn out the way I've been hoping all these years. So, and not reacting. When you stop reacting, it takes away a lot of power from the narcissist because they want that reinforcement when you react and you start Stop doing everything at their beck and call and stop trying to meet all their demands, which are insatiable, and you're you're never going to satisfy them anyway. And then you start setting boundaries. You start saying, that's not acceptable. Don't talk to me in that tone of voice. And here's what's going to happen. If, If you continue to do that, there's a price to be paid because they get away with it. So abuse that is allowed is abuse that's endorsed and if it's behavior that's endorsed will be repeated so that's what happens if you don't and then your your self-esteem gets lower and lower and the more you accommodate other people or narcissists the smaller your sense of self becomes you become totally out of alignment with your soul Um, now you become a shell of yourself so in terms of freeing your true self your true self gets lost you lose yourself in the relationship. A lot of people say when they're in love with a narcissist, that they have to choose between themselves and the relationship. And especially, for instance, if you start to get stronger or more powerful, they might the narcissist might feel um, threatened. And so they might want you to um, give up a career or try to control you. So they're number one. So you have to choose you know, between yourself and your partner. That's a horrible choice. A healthy relationship they want you to be your best. They want you to shine. They're proud of you. So some narcissists might be, and some might be threatened. It depends on the individual. So those are some of the steps. And then you have to learn, as we we're saying before, to build your own self-esteem and not make it dependent on someone else liking you or loving you or accepting you. Because whether it's the narcissist or your next relationship, uh, you'll be dependent on, that's not even self-esteem, it's others' esteem if it's dependent on what other people think. It has to come back to you. And it's unfamiliar. 
to codependence because they're so other oriented. Their behavior and thinking revolves around other people. Similarly, similar to a narcissist. But so it has to come from within and start to accept yourself and love yourself. And this will make you stronger. And then you're more in a position, you asked me about leading. When you get to that point, the relationship will likely improve. And if it doesn't, you're stronger now because a lot of people, their self-esteem is so damaged or they're afraid of the reaction or the repercussions from leaving the narcissist. Just like they're afraid to set boundaries. Well, leaving is a huge boundary. So you have to build up slowly, baby steps, I always say. Mm -hmm. To set small boundaries and consequences too. And then to, before you're ready to take the bigger step, to actually leave the relationship. You'll leave because you're so happy. You don't need that relationship anymore. Or the relationship will improve. And that happens with clients too. Relationship improves. They're happy with the relationship. That's rather interesting as well too. And this came to mind as well too. Does gaslighting uh, play part in a narcissism? That's been the big subject lately, gaslighting. That's right. It's very topical. And I have a blog on my website about gaslighting and section in the book on it too. They don't all gaslight, but, and some people gaslight and they're not narcissists. So <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just one kind of behavior. The facts get in the way. Okay. So if they want to do what they want and they don't want to be criticized, they'll deny it, or they'll maybe try to manipulate you to undermine you uh, with lies or, or saying, you don't know, you're starting to lose your memory, say all kinds of things like that to make you doubt yourself. That's really what gaslighting is. It's not a simple, just simple denial. No, I never flirted with that person. It's bigger scheme than that. It's really to undermine your sense of your own mind and make you really doubt yourself. Mm. That's what gaslighting is. And it can be very damaging. Uh, where can we find all your books at uh, Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist? More as well. I'm learning a lot about this as well too on Amazon and, and some other outlets, but you can pre-order it on my website, uh, whatiscodependency.com. Uh, if you forget that, you can just Google my name. I have a website, darlenelancer.com, and you can order it there. Uh, it's also for other devices. You can get a Smashwords, but all the links to all of that is on my website, whatiscodependency.com. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Oh, Trust yourself, trust yourself. And, and talking about narcissism and abusive relationships, if you suspect that you might be being abused, you probably are. Now, people usually don't think that unless they have good reason to. Mm. So it doesn't matter if someone says, oh, that wasn't. I mean, if your partner or whatever says, no, I'm not abusing you, you're crazy. If you feel like you're being abused, you probably are. And talk to get help. Especially if there's any violence, don't wait. Call a hotline, seek out therapy, and okay. get a safe place to go to. Once again, author Darlene Lancer, licensed marriage and a family therapist, international relationship expert on the Mike Wagner Show with the book, Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist. How do Great. people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your books? What is codependency.com? There's all links to amongst all social media. I have a YouTube channel and Twitter, Facebook on Clip It, and I have a media page on my website with all of my interviews. Do sign up for my monthly blog because I have over 200 blogs. Um, I also blog on Medium, but they're all on my website too. Darlene, a very big thank you for your time. Thank you. 